Shalom. Today we are going to talk about the orthography of the Shema. Orthography, a nice big word. If you've ever had your teeth straightened by a dentist, he's an orthodontist. The ortho part means straight or aligned, and the dentist part is the dentist, right? So orthography has to do with straight, aligned writing. So it can be about spelling, but it can also be about how the words are written, and that's what we're going to look at. You may have heard in the past that all Torah scrolls are exactly the same from beginning to end, and that's not exactly true. I think 99.9% .9 of the words are the same, but there are little flourishes and differences which are not uniform ac across all scrolls. For example, there are some letters that are upside down, there are dots on some of the letters, maybe you've heard of some of these things, large letters, small letters, letters that are lifted up, and also the little crowns, as you see on the examples here. The crowns are called tagin, and they are not uniform across the scrolls either. So if you can read this first example here, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And you see a large letter bet there. This is very typical in, in most scrolls. And it's just a flourish. We do the same thing in some English books. Maybe in a child's fairy tale book, you will see an oversized letter like O oh, once upon a time. And this is called a drop cap. In the second example, you see there's a circle, a red circle, around a vav in the word shalom. And this is called the broken vav. And this takes place during the story of Pinchas, where he goes and impales the idolaters in the midst of the camp. And it says that God will give him a covenant of peace. But the shalom, the vav, is broken. And so people interpret that, well, it's not a perfect peace because he achieved it by violent means. If you're interested in more discussion of these uh, scribal anomalies, I recommend to you this website. It's a website of Mordechai Pinchas, who is a professional sofer. He's a professional Torah scroll writer, and he has many interesting things about the letters and about composing Torah scrolls uh, on his website. So you can go check that out. One thing that is uniform across scrolls is in Deuteronomy 6.4, where is written the Shema, which is called the watchword of Israel. Shema Yisrael Yehovah Eloheinu Yehovah Echad. And in all examples of Torah scrolls, the ayin at the end of Shema is enlarged, and the dalid at the end of Echad is also enlarged. Here you can see it in more plain print. Now it may be that if you go and open the Tanakh that you have, a printed book, that you will not see this. This is not printed in every edition. It depends on the publisher whether they include these anomalies or not in a printed book, but it will be in every Torah scroll. Now, one thing that is interesting about this word, ayin dalit, which is seemingly formed by these two large letters, is that it means witness, and that's good. We consider this to be our witness, our pledge of allegiance to Yehovah. The ayin, the Paleo-Hebrew sign, is an eye. Ayin, in fact, means eye in Hebrew. And you can see the picture of the eye. The other picture of the dalet is like the word dilet, which means door. This may not look like a door to you, but it might look like a door to somebody who lives in a tent, and they have a flap coming down, and that covers the opening of their tent. So the witness is the person who can see the door. They can see the way to go. There are many words that are based on this root, ayin dalid. The first is, as we said, witness, Genesis 31, 44. Now, therefore, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. Deuteronomy 17, 6. At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. If we add a hey 
we have a word eda, which means congregation. The congregation, of course, should be the witness to the world that we belong to Yehovah. Exodus 12.3 Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. In Psalm 111, verse 1, Praise ye Jehovah. I will praise Jehovah with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, in the place which provides the witness. A related word, a dut, means a testimony. Exodus 16:34. As Jehovah commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. In Psalm 119, 129, Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore does my soul keep them. An unusual word, edi, means ornaments. Exodus 33, 4-6 And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man put on him his ornaments. For Jehovah had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. This is as a result of the golden calf incident. They no longer are reflective of being a witness. Their ornaments are not allowed to be worn because they don't deserve to wear them because they have disobeyed the Lord. In Jeremiah 2.32 can a maid forget her ornaments, or her bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me, days without number. To make a verb, ya'ad, means to make an appointment. Uh, we see in Exodus 21, 9, if he have betrothed her to his son, he's made an appointment that they're going to get married. He shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. In Exodus 25, 22, and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. From this verb comes the word moed, which you know, Genesis 1, 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Here it's translated as seasons. I talked a little bit about this in my latest podcast, and uh, I'll put a link below for that. Leviticus 23.4, these are the feasts of Jehovah, even holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their seasons. These are the appointed times, the moedim. Now another related meaning is ed. Exodus 15.18 Yehovah shall reign forever and ever. Maybe you are familiar with the phrase, Leolam va'ed, until eternity and beyond, forever and ever. It's continuous. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father is Avi, Av, Avi, Ad, the Father that goes for on and on and on. And so we see that all the testimonies, all the witness, all the Moedim, these are things that go forever. One more related word is Od, which means to be again or in a continuous state. Genesis 4, 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, had appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Again, the idea of continuing on. Uh, Psalm 139.18 If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. I continue to be with thee. Now, what would be the importance in particular of making the Dalit larger? If you've been reading for any amount of time, you know that the most confusing pair of letters is the Dalit, which you see on the left, and the Resh, which you see on the right. The Resh has a smooth back, and the Dalit pushes back a little bit first before it goes down. You can see that it's difficult to see the difference, even if you're not a reader. 
the difference between these two letters. And so there's another verse that has a large resh in it for the same reason that the Shema has the large dalit in it. And that is this verse, Exodus 34, 14. You shall not bow down, prostrate yourself, to a God, acher means other. So we wouldn't want to say they're echad because our God is the echad. So we don't want to prostrate ourselves to another, a different God. So there's an oversized resh here, so we don't make that reading mistake between the dalit and the resh. Why? Because Yehovah is a jealous God. His name is jealous and he is jealous. Let's look at that for a minute. So from an etymology site online, we see that the words jealous and zealous actually come from the same root and the same context. Possessive or suspicious, but originally in a context of sexuality or romance. They come from an old French, jealous, jealous, I am not a French reader, and uh, there's a modern word French. But they're from Latin, from the idea of zeal, and also in Greek, a similar root, zealous, which sometimes mean jealous. In a good sense, we see in biblical language, it means tolerating no unfaithfulness. The reason I bring this up is that in the past several years, a person of extreme renown thought that how could God be jealous of this person? What has this person got? that God doesn't have. But that is not the meaning of a jealous God at all. He is jealous not of you. He is jealous for you. He is zealous. He tolerates no unfaithfulness. Why? Because you belong to him and he wants all of you. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Listen, Israel, Yehovah is our God. Yehovah is one. Shema Yisrael, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu. Shema Yisrael.